On May 27th, 2022, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind opened at Epcot. As an indoor roller coaster, Cosmic Rewind is not terrible. In fact, it's fun. Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind is fun. As legendary Imagineer Joe Rohde left the company in January of 2021, six months later he posted this picture on Instagram with the following message. Fun. In the business of entertainment design, you will come across people who will say, why can't it just be fun? This question is often an accusatory form of microaggression, and really means, why are you wasting so much time on intellectual BS and overbred aesthetic sensibility? But there is a logical answer. Fun is cheap. I can have fun in an inflatable pool in my backyard. I can have fun playing basketball by the garage. I can have fun watching videos of snarky cats. This fun costs very little. An inflatable pool costs 50 bucks or less and can be used many times. A trip to a major entertainment venue like a Broadway play or theme park can cost many hundreds of dollars per visit all in. So are these places just plain fun? Are they hundreds or thousands of times more fun than shooting silly string at each other on the porch? Probably not. Therefore, fun cannot possibly be the motivating factor in the compulsive, repetitive, overscale patronage of the theme park industry. The motive is simply not competitive enough based on other options. People must be paying this kind of money and making this kind of effort for a reward that is of higher value, more rare, and of greater impact than fun. That reward is many things, among which is the sensation of transport, of being moved magically into another place or another time. It is the intensity of experience which results in permanent memories. It is the rare sensation of cohesiveness, harmony, and thematic organization which allows the human brain to relax and be absorbed. I could go on. But all of these properties reside in the obsessive execution of coordinated detail, resulting in places with a strange, otherworldly attraction. And that is not cheap. In fact, theme parks are repositories of human time, effort, and yes, money, which guests sense through the level of detail, organization, and intensity. Theme parks are a form of communication between designers and audiences. They are relationships. People like worthy, meaningful, invested relationships, not cheap ones. I very much interpreted this as a warning. Disney parks, Epcot especially, were designed as engaging works of art, meant to have meaning beyond just fun. Epcot has been slowly decaying for decades, but with the premiere of Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, it has finally brought about the new age. Epcot quickly went from being my favorite park to something that I now consider a waste of my time. Today we're going to be exploring Cosmic Rewind as an attraction, and consequently, the final senseless death of Epcot. If you were to visit a park like Six Flags and expected theming, you probably wouldn't be very impressed. Six Flags is fine for what it is, but what we cannot deny is that it's just cheap fun. That's exactly what we expect. It's one thing to build a roller coaster, but another to slap an identifiable intellectual property onto it, hoping to attract people with the iconography of a character with pop cultural relevancy. Does naming a roller coaster Mr. Freeze Reverse Blast really up the appeal? I'm not saying that this is a bad coaster, but at its core, the name and loose theme are essentially just superficial marketing, masking a middle-tier attraction that does nothing special. 
It's just plain fun. Six Flags embracing DC and Looney Tunes theming means very little to their park goers. I'm not disregarding Six Flags parks because they're pretty upfront about what kind of experience they're offering, but their relationship to their consumers is intellectually cheap. Let me ask you this then. Why are Disney consumers so often complacent when Disney does this themselves? Slinky Dog Dash is probably the best example of this, and that's just a generically themed coaster that could exist in any park. It quite literally exists to just fill up space, yet you often see rave reviews for whatever reason. With perhaps the exception of Pandora, Disney has not built any meaningful attractions since Michael Eisner. It has become a place that clearly reflects a lack of respect for its audience, substituting the theme park experience for the quick emotional high of viewing a character that you perhaps liked in a movie. Again, not inherently bad, but it's certainly not the reason that people have visited Disney for decades, gaining their reputation as the leader in the theme park industry. If this is the standard of excellence, why would anyone shell out the money for a Disney park when Six Flags would be the more reasonable option? Epcot in its first decade was probably the peak of Disney Imagineering. I've already done a video exploring its various attractions and the content within, so I'm not going to dive into that here. But what is important to take away is its emphasis on edutainment. The park and its attractions respected the intellectual capacity of its audience, attempting to inspire people's imaginations with an optimistic and reverent message about the role technology would play in the advancement of humankind. The World Showcase would then present representations of different cultures and nations around the world, reinforcing humanistic themes of cooperation and celebrating the diversity of different cultures. Disneyland first challenged the idea of an amusement park, existing as not just a place to have clean, fun entertainment, but it served as an example of how many different artistic disciplines could come together into a surreal but often meaningful and transformative experience. So too did early Epcot challenge the idea of the theme park, hoping to provide lessons and have a meaningful impact beyond just the entertainment value. Spaceship Earth focused on the history and importance of communication. World of Motion was very much the same, but the topic was instead transportation. The universe of energy focused naturally on powering the world. Listen to the Lands would cover the diversity of different ecosystems, and from there focused on the future of sustainable farming. In the same pavilion, Kitchen Cabaret would stress the importance of proper nutrition. The Living Seas dived into ocean science, and Journey into Imagination stressed the importance of the arts in all disciplines. The attraction that tied this all together would be Horizons, working as a sequel to the Carousel of Progress and as a thesis statement for Future World. It combined the disciplines and subjects of the other pavilions into one vision, portraying an incredibly optimistic and endearing interpretation of a possible future. The Mexico Pavilion hosted El Rio del Tiempo, an educational attraction focused on the history and people of Mexico. Later, the Norway Pavilion would open in 1988, hosting Maelstrom, an attraction that focused on Norwegian history, mythology, and culture. The following year, the Wonders of Life Pavilion would open in Future World, focusing on the importance of personal health and the biology of the body. Epcot in its first decade challenged its audience to have fun, but also intended to inspire them, believing that they could lead the future. The attractions were all incredibly unique in both concept and execution. Still, Epcot would slowly close or replace these attractions as contracts with their corporate sponsors would expire. World of Motion would eventually be replaced with Test Track, and while definitely one of the best and most nuanced attractions ever created by Imagineering, managed to not live up to the reverent themes of Epcot. Mission Space would eventually replace Horizons, existing with the marketable gimmick of simulating the G-forces of a rocket launch, but not feeling particularly substantial. Journey into Imagination would go through two iterations to become the underwhelming experience it is today, the Living Seas would get a meaningless Finding Nemo ride, and Kitchen Cabaret would eventually be updated to the hip Food Rocks, and eventually torn down to make way for Soren. This era of Epcot wasn't terrible, but it very much reflected a decline in the theme. While many of these attractions were entertaining, they simply lacked the depth of their predecessors, 
instead focusing on appealing to a younger crowd with thrills or pop cultural relevancy. I've argued before that the idea of outdated Epcot is a myth, with this new slate of attractions becoming stale far more quickly than any of Epcot's first decade of attractions ever would have. Epcot would sit stagnant for decades until 2017 with the closure of Ellen's Energy Adventure, announcing a brand new Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster would be replacing it. So, that brings us to today. Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind is part of the Epcot overhaul, often referred to as the Bob Iger Vanity Project. In the past, I've criticized Bob Chapek for the absolutely stupid endeavor that was this announced festival building, but it has since been revealed that Iger was the mastermind behind this abysmal new era for the park. In retrospect though, I've realized that this overhaul quietly started with the re-theme of El Rio del Tiempo into the Grand Fiesta Tour in 2007. Instead of making any meaningful updates to the attraction, it was a cheap overhaul that replaced the educational content with the annoying antics of the three caballeros, sticking in recycled animatronics at the end from the Mickey Mouse review. It's my understanding that this overhaul was done with the intention of finding a place to stuff Jose Carioca into the parks as a way to draw in Brazilians. If true, it shows how little respect Iger had for the park guests even back then, opting for cheap pandering rather than meaningful investment. This would then be followed by a reimagining of Test Track in 2012, removing its best elements and downgrading the ride into some generic computer simulation on the cheap. While not an IP tie-in, the aesthetic very much seems designed with the intent to remind people of Tron, as Tron Legacy had just released two years prior. Finally, Maelstrom will be replaced with Frozen Ever After in 2016, which you probably already know my thoughts on. Low effort, has nothing to do with Norway, and exists to sell merchandise to elementary school-aged kids. In 2019, the massive Epcot overhaul would really begin, tearing out the center of Future World in favor of new retail space, an unsubstantial Moana water play area, and eventually canceling the fireworks dessert party building in favor of kind of rebuilding what was already there as a new festival space. You know, something that they could have done without wasting money on demolishing the previous buildings. In 2021, Epcot would open the underwhelming Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, restaurants in the World Showcase would continue to degrade in quality, and the Disney sing-along nighttime show Harmonious would debut, really reinforcing the idea that Disney leadership sees the theming of this half of the park as an inconvenience. They want more character implementation to sell more merchandise, so it has now become a game of turning the World Showcase into a backdrop for these clumsily implemented and poorly justified additions. Walking around the new, uninspired and Apple Store-esque creation shop, or the completely meaningless Connections Cafe, I often find myself wondering why I even go to Epcot anymore. Epcot, even in its decline through the Eisner era, was undoubtedly my favorite park, but I've realized how quickly it has shifted to become a place I almost loathe. Every time I walk into the park, I ask myself, why am I here? It feels like a dated, meaningless skeleton of a park that died long ago, propped up financially by perpetual food festivals that serve low quality and overpriced dishes. The two attractions I still enjoy, Spaceship Earth and Living with the Land, are very visibly suffering from neglect. The rest of the park is filled with either aging relics of the Eisner era, or the new and often intellectually insulting recent additions. Now that we've set the stage, that brings us now to Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, bringing about the new era of Epcot as meaningless, disposable, and fun. Before offering my thoughts, let me first walk you through what the attraction entails. Walking in through the entrance, you'll first encounter a sign revealing that you're entering the Wonders of Xandar Pavilion. The first room you'll walk into is the Galaxarium, designed as a more broadly focused version of a planetarium. The concepts behind the attraction is rather meta, as the building is intended to fit in with the other pavilions of Epcot as if the Marvel characters are real. The queue is full of exposition, 
indicating that Epcot was chosen as the place to showcase Xandar because of its educational value. Obviously, that's quite ironic, as Epcot has devolved so heavily from that concept, and this attraction works against that exact mission and theme of the park. The rest of the queue consists of exposition and displays related to Xandar, often focusing on how Ronin attempted to destroy the planet and recounting the events of the first film. There's even a portion where Peter Quill appears for an interview, being visibly excited about visiting Epcot again and talking about how much he wants to ride Horizons, see the dinosaurs in the universe of energy, and sing Veggie Veggie Fruit Fruit, only to be disappointed that it's all gone. From there, guests are funneled into a pre-show holding area, and finally led into what would be the first of two pre-shows. Here you're introduced to Glenn Close as Nova Prime, who provides quick lip service to the Big Bang, and then starts to provide exposition. She states that even at the speed of light, it would take over 2 million years just to reach Xandar, and so to aid and transport throughout the universe, they use a tool called the Cosmic Generator, which creates jump points or wormholes through space. Nova Prime then says that she wants to share this technology with Earth, and that as part of the demonstration, everyone will be teleported to a Xandarian ship. From here, Terry Crews appears, introducing himself as Centurion Tal Merrick, and stating that everyone is going to be stepping into a teleportation chamber. This part of the video also expresses that, going forward, there is to be no video recording of any kind, which is something that I didn't oblige to follow and no cast members seem concerned to enforce. Just in case anyone was wondering, I go out of my way when recording things so as not to bother other people, turning the screen brightness all the way down, holding the camera close to my body, and blocking the light so as not to disturb others. From here, the room moves forward into the teleportation chamber. It's essentially just a light show with a lot of strobing, finishing with a final flash in darkness that blinds the audience as trick walls move up into the ceiling, revealing that you're now on a Zendarian ship. You can see the Cosmic Generator in front of you as the Xandarians start to speak about it, but through what I believe is a mirror trick, it disappears. Nova Prime then calls in the help of the Guardians of the Galaxy who appear on screen. Soon after, a Celestial appears outside of the main window, now in possession of the Cosmic Generator and stating that humanity has failed. It uses the Generator to create a jump point back in time to the dawn of the universe to erase an error. Peter Quill appropriately quips that this all seems rather vague. Tal Merrick says that he's going to get ready to evacuate the ship, but Rocket steps in, saying that all the visitors should instead board ships and follow through the jump point so as to keep track of the Celestial. The doors open into a new part of the Xandarian ship, with Quill restating that everyone needs to make their way to the shuttles. From here, there is a small portion of the queue as you look out over the dual loading stations. One thing I really liked about the platform was the scale, as well as a designated area for front row requests to stand, making the loading process really efficient. Once you board the vehicle, it travels through the hallways of the ship as the Guardians appear on screens, preparing you to journey into space, equipping as they do so. The vehicles then move out into space and through the still open jump point, finally encountering both the Guardians and the Celestial itself. Peter yells that no one is going to stop rock and roll from existing, and suddenly the world goes black as everyone jumps back in time, and the train launches backwards into the gravity building. As this happens, one of six possible songs is chosen at random that will play throughout the duration of the ride course. The rest of the experience is essentially Space Mountain, where the vehicles will turn to look at certain scenes where the battle is happening. The action is rather difficult to really discern, especially as the music drowns out the character audio, but from what I can gather, it's just the Guardians and Zendarian ships fighting to get back the Cosmic Generator as you move forward in time through various jump points. There's a portion where you spin around the moon and then Earth itself, so I'm under the assumption that this indicates that you're jumping through time. The gravity portion finally ends, bringing you back into the Wonders of Xandar Pavilion and rounding the corner where you see one final transmission from the team, who welcome you back as honorary Guardians of the Galaxy. From here you enter the Unload Station and back into Epcot. So what's my opinion of the ride? It's fun. In fact it's so fun that it's the first Disney attraction since What a Passage that I really actually like. The coaster portion is incredibly well done and is something that I would definitely wait a few hours to ride. 
The experience overall is really well put together, and while I absolutely hate what it means for the future of Epcot, I can't deny an excellent attraction when I see one. That's an initial impression, so let's move on to the specifics of what I did and did not like. While I loathe what Disney leadership has done to Epcot as a park, at the very least, presenting the wonders of Xandar as an Epcot pavilion is interesting. The atmosphere within the queue feels almost a bit 1980s to me, especially with one section using ceiling tiles like the older Disney rides and Epcot pavilions often did. The queue itself, while obviously not concerned with real-world material, reminds me quite a bit of the old queue from The Living Seas, which displayed artifacts and information on ocean exploration. Here, it is instead the culture and technology of Xandar. I'm a bit mixed on how I feel about this, as it's clear not just here but through the rest of the new renovated areas of the park that there's a lot of references and design choices meant to emulate elements of the original Epcot. For example, the big open windows of Connections seems meant to evoke the feeling of the original open space of Communicore. However, most of this is superficial and doesn't cover for the still mostly uncompelling new nature of the park. Still, the atmosphere within the pavilion portion of the queue is really well executed, so I can say that I like it overall. When cast members walk on stage, there are often mirrors at the threshold to remind them of keeping proper appearances within guest view. As you exit Guardians, there is a similar mirror to this, indicating that you've returned to the pavilion and are exiting from a backstage area. It's a small detail, but a clever one. One other detractor is that the Galaxarium isn't nearly as impressive as Disney tried to market it, with the screen feeling rather flat, which is something that carries over to all the other screen-based portions of the attraction as well. The first room of the pre-show is fine, and the second has some impressive magic tricks with the retractable walls and disappearing cosmic generator. The dialogue is often funny as well, helping you to overlook the rather thin reasoning for journeying into space with the Guardians. Of course, the ride portion itself is where I find myself most enthused, being surprisingly more intense than what I expected. I think it's important to distinguish that the ride vehicles don't spin, so much as they enter a controlled turn throughout most portions of the ride track. This leads to some pretty fun lateral g-forces, which is what makes the coaster so appealing to me. For once, it feels like Disney focused on having a solid track layout, making the overall attraction experience a priority over slapping the Guardians onto it. In regards to intensity, I've seen a lot of people shout that this is the most intense Disney coaster ever created. That's pretty obviously untrue, as there are no inversions, so Rock and Roller Coaster and the Incredicoaster are definitely more intense. If I had to gauge the intensity level, I would place it about equal or slightly lower than Expedition Everest, which is very much a welcome thrill level for the Disney parks. I'm tired of Disney building coasters like Slinky Dog or Seven Dwarfs that are being outclassed by something like the Barnstormer. If you're going to build a roller coaster, commit to it. Otherwise, there's no point, just build a dark ride. So, with an exceptionally fun track layout, how is the story portrayed? Well, once you reach the gravity portions, not very well. There's so much going on that the content doesn't really matter. Disney has essentially just built the newest version of Space Mountain, but with a Guardians of the Galaxy overlay, which brings me to my biggest problem. I wish that Disney wasn't building Tron, and would have put this into Magic Kingdom's Tomorrowland instead, as it's a much better fit. It really is the new generation of Space Mountain, as at its core, it's just a fun track layout inside of a dark building, made to make you feel like you're flying through space. Would placing this right next to Space Mountain be redundant? Sure, but even the aesthetic fits so much better in Tomorrowland, and still would have worked. People may have been asking why Disney built two Space Mountains right next to each other, but it's such a fun attraction that I don't think that anyone would have truly cared. Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout is... fun. I like it, and I would go out of my way to ride it, but it doesn't change the fact that Epcot is now dead. It's a place that no longer matters. It's a place where education no longer takes precedence. 
It's a place that no longer has any theme or meaning. It's just... fun. If you enjoyed these types of video essays, an easy way to help the channel out is to just leave a like on the video. As always, if you want to be notified when new videos are released, I strongly recommend hitting the subscribe button with bell notification as well.